course. Uh, dude, that game's insane. That part where there's that giant, and like the little boy, but he's <laughs> like a giant robot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got a statue, he's like, a giant robot statue of himself. Why wouldn't he? Yeah. Yo, hello, it's Unicorn Hole. Welcome to the very first fifth episode of Down the Unicorn Hole. This is the show where I interview people who are rad and related to Nintendo Core in one way or another. Today's guest is John DeCampos, who you might recognize from Cowabunga Pizza Time, or Blight Beast, or Terrible Games, or as Ghost Bat, or from frickin' Bitgen, or probably 15 other things. How you doing, John? <laughs> Good, dude. How are you, John? Doing John, great. John, John, good to see another John. That's right. And we both got H's. You checked with we, me the yeah, first time we the met. Non-H's are another faction. I don't know about them. I don't know what they're about. I know that the H faction, we're super solid, can be trusted, and usually pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, the, I don't. I don't know what they're up to. What like getting rid of that yeah. H? Yeah. I think yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, they've shortened their name, from what I understand. I, I, you know, we don't need to get into it because I can't speak on it. To be real with you, I, I don't know any. I don't really because I don't. It's not my deal. But anyway, I think it's yeah. better if we don't. I think the less is said, the better. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So normally, I uh, I like to start these by giving an uh, an earnest compliment to my guest, which is pretty easy because I tend to have people on who I'm a fan of. And uh, when I was scripting this and I was like, what do I say to John? I was like, I don't even know which thing to talk about because you're involved in so many things. And then I realized that, well, that's it. That's the compliment. You're a renaissance man. You do 5,000 things and all of them are freaking cool. And I don't know how you do it, man. I don't know how you keep up with all that. Oh, thanks so much. I'll tell you how I do it. Um, my my spouse and baby mama makes a really healthy salary working for a tech company in San Francisco. She awesome. works remotely. And the amount of money she makes is un- is comfortable enough that the lights stay on regardless of whether I just decide to stop working. Dang. So um, I uh, I don't stop working. I just do the stuff that I like to do and that sometimes makes money. It's a good thing that I don't need to absolutely survive every single day to day, week to week on the stuff that I do. Um, I, think, I think I could maybe cobble together a living if I had to do that. But for right now, uh, I'm just I'm, – I'm trying to – treat terrible games like a startup and mm. not you know not squander my privilege that i have right now and and hopefully it'll be profitable and it'll be a real company we're still in the under the five-year mark you know a lot of small businesses take five years before they really get going so um there's that and then you know the freelance art stuff is is kind of a side hustle at this point because the board game company is kind of my main deal but uh and music is just so i can see all my see all my pals and and play shows i like to i like to perform and play shows and uh, that's why, I, but uh, the reason I have the ability to do all of the stuff I do is because I have a really supportive partner who's who's great at what she does. That's fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Love my wife to death, but we're not in that situation. I've talked to her about it before, and I was like, how much do you like ramen and hot dogs? Just asking. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, people who are here for bit gen hype, we are going to talk about that, but I was thinking we would start with your music projects. That's typically what I talk about most on this uh, channel. So if if it's cool with you, we'll start with Cowabunga Pizza Time. Sure. And also, I'm going to lob a compliment in your direction. The way that you and I became connected is because I found your material from Unicorn Hole on Bandcamp, and my jaw hit the floor because I was like actual nintendo core finally you know i felt like that that term got thrown a lot around uh the early 2000s and i never really felt like there was a band that really aptly fit it i suppose that horse the band you could probably make a strong argument that they're nintendo core however i really felt that what they did was they were just a metal band with keyboards that Mm. every once in a while they fit in a nintendo leitmotif they weren't really a nintendo core band in my eyes um so Hats off to you, as far as I'm concerned. I thought that you were really, like, owning the genre qualifier and doing it with gusto. So, yeah, man, nice fucking work. And I'm psyched to have you guys back again for BitGen this year. Well, heck yeah. Uh, I appreciate you saying that. I think everything you said about Horse, I I do agree with. They did coin the term, but there's uh, other bands since then that have taken it a lot more literally uh, and run with it like we have. I yeah if if we if we want to talk about bands like I'd I'd love to talk about Cowbunga Pizza Time but we do original music for anybody who's not familiar and I don't know if I've if I've talked to you about this but um 
I was in a early video game cover band that was around like there was like the mini bosses, the advantage, and then like a class of video game, like the graduating class of like 2006 or 2007 okay. of video game cover bands that came out, which was like This Place is Haunted, Year 2000X, um, Power Glove, uh, and one of the bands I was in called Entertainment System. So I, I did like metal versions of video game covers for seven, 16 years, something like that. Okay, damn. And then. Um, I was also in a video game cover band that was mo mostly synth driven called Rare Candy for quite a while for I think like seven or eight years. Um, and then Calbunga Pizza Time is a, is an all original like sort of punk metal. It's Ninja Turtles cosplaying as humans, basically. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, in the band were humans who skateboard, eat pizza, live in the sewers, kick the shit out of ninjas and like defend our friends and are all about like brotherhood. Um, but we are like unaware of this idea of a pop culture thing called Ninja Turtles. It's just like a weird coincidence. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is, it kind of sprang from this. We used to have these events here in Baltimore called the fill in the blank night at the wind up space where it'd be like Ghostbusters night or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles night okay. or Twister night, you know, the hurricane movie. Mm. And people would come cosplay it as characters from the film and pop up bands would form to do like, four song sets where they would like cover a couple pieces of music from the movie and also like write two or three originals that were inspired by the film. That's awesome. And it, yeah, it was awesome. And we would screen the films and these ridiculous one time only bands would come up and perform and people would do cosplay and we had crazy food that was themed after the mo movies. Um, and we, I, I, or after our Ghostbusters night and an an another one of them that was just super successful, I was like, I'm going to do a Ninja Turtles one. And the, the band we formed for it was called Cowbunga Pizza Time. And, the material we wrote for the for the set and just everything about the band that we were all like this is awesome we should just keep doing this and it's been 10 years now we still do it yeah that's awesome oh you mentioned 10 years i was gonna say that next uh your your self-titled full length turns 10 next year you have any plans to do anything to celebrate that um uh, yeah we wanted to release something uh, we did get to play the MAGFest main stage to ring in this year which was pretty awesome way Heck to ring yeah. in the 10 year anniversary Congrats. Thank you. Um, yeah, we wanted to do an album release this year, and that could still happen, but just like at the very end of the year is when it might happen, but we're still trying to figure it out. Okay. That would be a third full length? Yeah. And when I say full length, it's shaping up to probably be like six, seven, maybe eight songs, but somewhere in that region. I don't think we're going to be able to hit 10 songs, but we'll see how it goes. Okay. You got any idea how long it is, like runtime? Nope. Nope. Okay. Cause no idea. I've got normally our stuff usually runs about three minutes per song. Right. Okay. I've gotten to where I don't know. For me, like a twenty-five to thirty-five minute album is my preference. A lot of bands release like an hour and a half long album that feels excessive to me. Depends on the genre, I guess. But no, that sounds about right. Like a, an album should sort of be like seeing. It should be kind of like seeing the band live, and nobody should really yeah. perform more than like thirty minutes unless they're like amazing like crazy crazy good but yeah yeah right. that's the sweet spot your second full length is secret of the booze correct yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. So how would you compare your first two albums they're both doing similar things i think like the tone and mood of like Calabunga as a sound is really cohesive generally across the board there's more departure material coming off of like this new suite of songs that we have coming up okay. which i'm gonna chalk up to the pandemic like I wrote some stuff for the band where I was trying to work out some stuff oh, okay. <laughs> um, and we're, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but like I was actually, I was, I was talking to my bandmates about this recently, how like the mentality before lockdown with this band, like we were riding so much momentum and there was just like generally like this sort of youthful excitement that was happening around Cowabunga where like the trajectory of our songwriting and everything we were doing was very like, locked in and in its lane and doing what it was supposed to do and then like we took this two-year break and we sort of had to like reassess and like figure out who we were a little bit because like it was just weird man like we we did this split with our buddies in infinite pizza that was that i think turned out great i i really liked the way that it turned out some of the material i'm talking about where i was like this is a little angrier this is a, mm -hmm. a little bit you know that's that's on that split <laughs> um is but it, like, yeah, we we just got out of the group groove of like meeting regularly and playing shows regularly, and it just kind of like, yeah, we're we're sort of like getting back into that mode over the last like year or so, and uh, 
it it also is kind of weird because we are all older and like you know two of us have kids and yeah it it, it starts to, after 10 years also you know like it's a it's a whole thing man yeah for sure I feel like if you're a band that's already doing something super original like you guys are, there's not so much pressure to like introduce a lot of new elements as you go along anyway, because it's not like you're competing with other similar bands, really. Uh, if you if you find yeah. a unique lane, you can kind of stay in it, more or less. Yeah, absolutely. But like even even in that even in that idea of like, yeah, we're writing original music. Like we're not doing, I'm, we're no longer doing like video game covers. And every once in a while we do sprinkle some of those in. Mm. Um, there are like basic like signposts, like musically and stylistically that we are trying to hit. Like we, you know, I think that we probably take a page from bands like uh, Andrew WK or Turbo Negro or, um, it, you know, for my part, like really fun anthemic uh, early Weezer is probably yeah. a big influence for, for Cowabunga. So you know, like there's there's certain like things that guide what we do artistically, but um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's 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 still super fun. Uh, yeah, we're we're actually playing a show. If anybody in Baltimore is listening to this on June Wednesday, June 26th, we're playing with Belushi Speedball, and I'm I'm super stoked because that band fucking rules. I hope we get this out before that. <laughs> it may not. <laughs> we'll have to see. Okay. We'll do That's our best. Right. If not, figure it out. The Ninja Turtles time travel, and you can too. Um, yeah, it's true. So the split with Infinite Pizza, they, there's a band called Infinite Pizza in Baltimore, Maryland, and Cowabunga Pizza Time, and that just happened by coincidence. Yeah, and we're friends with them, like, beforehand. That was fake. We knew all, like, yeah, yeah. And we played a bunch of shows together. We're all cool, and absolutely. It just made sense for us to do a split also. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I love that uh, split, and the, you covered one of each other's songs on it, right? We covered two of each other's songs, and okay, we titled okay. it Albunga Infinite Pizza Time. Yeah, okay. Super super cool split. So uh, for someone who's never listened to Cowabunga Pizza Time, where would you recommend they start? Do you have like a favorite track or one that you feel like captures oh, the, the essence of the yeah. band? Yeah, We Ride. We Ride is uh, on the first album, and I'll, and I'll say why. First of all, like we performed it at 99% of every show we do because it has this fun audience call and response section. Mm -hmm. And we've done stuff like during, it's like, it's just this, there's this breakdown where we can like vamp with like these, this Tom Phil, it's like do, 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 that we can just do forever. Right. Um, so we do stuff where we have people come on stage and like do board breaking and stuff. And uh, we have like all this fun call and response and we've given out pizza to people before mm -hmm. it was weird to give food out to people. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's also like one of the first original songs we wrote as a group. And I always, I still enjoy playing it today. So that's got to be it. That's got to be the one. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, anything else you want to say about Cowbunga Pizza Time? Like, if you come to our shows, uh, get get some of our merch and like sew it onto your favorite vest, please. Yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, their shows are as awesome as they sound like they would be. I mean, he described them a little bit, but I feel like even just looking at the albums on Bandcamp and like listening to the music, you can tell that it's going to be a good time live. So can confirm. Uh, so you're also in a shreddy, like doom metal band called blight beast. Uh, my doom metal band is haze mage. Um, however, okay. my, uh, this is what I've been calling blight beast. We're a prog death core band okay well give us a, um, a brief description then of both of those those are both still active yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so haze mage i play drums and it's like sword and sorcery doom stoner heavy metal um it's yeah it's like traditional traditional metals uh heavy metal style like 70s yeah. era uh heavy metal but there is like some very clear like iron maiden judas priest kind of harmonized lead guitar stuff happening um, there is some slower sludgy stuff and our subject matter usually touches on like, you know, marching up a spiral mountain surrounded by giant bones on the way to kill a cyclops that murdered your son. <laughs> like that's, Classic. that's a song. Yeah. That's a song that we have called ogre. That's about, that's what it's about. <laughs> um, and then, uh, blight beast is, a uh, progressive death core and, my lead singer doesn't like that I toss on the core at the end, mm. but I was explaining to him that we do open D halftime breakdowns with harmonized counter melodies. So th that's just the truth. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. 
that's just the way it is, you know? Um, but that one is a lot more like technical and on, on the proggy side of things, like, yeah, we, we, we do like weird stuff with timing. Our lead singer, like has this like very unique, like texture to his voice where it's just, it's basically like another instrument. Like we have lyrics mm -hmm. and he's totally saying them. But when you listen to our stuff, like it's another sound happening. Um, we're going to release our first album in August, I think is our release date, August 10th for our, our, our debut EP called Viscera. Um, and for Blight Beast, this is actually like the first time I've been on a project that isn't like, we are a Ninja Turtle geek culture band, or I, this is a video game cover band, or mm -hmm. this is a Motown cover band, or it's, you know, there isn't like some sort of like shtick or hook right. that we're tagging onto it. It's just me and my good pals who fucking love metal are making metal that sounds cool to us. That's all it is. Nothing wrong with that. Blight Beast only has right now like live videos on YouTube and stuff. You don't have recordings up yet, do you? We don't, but it's coming. Okay. Uh, yeah, Viscera is recorded. Like we have, I'm waiting on my bass player Tyler to fucking put in his last notes on the final mix. So fucking that Tyler, get it together, dude. I know, dude. I was, I was fucking chewing him out yesterday. Goblin, would you please relax? <laughs> what is Goblin? Goblin's my dog. Okay, I love it. I don't know. If, I don't know if you heard him back there growling. I didn't, but maybe I'll, it's in the. I'll see if he'll come out. I'll, I'll show him if he come out. So if he comes out later, <laughs> please do. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I will. Is a uh, blight beast a Warcraft reference? Nope. All right, just had to check. Had to check for the because when you Google blight beast, you guys come up, but also a bunch of Warcraft stuff comes up. So I figured I would see if the, if there was a video game reference in there. I think blight beast is uh, probably from several things. So. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. We it took us a really long time to arrive at a name for the band. Um initially, I really liked the band name Ort. Uh O O R T, which is this like theoretical cloud of like space particles that happened at the at the dawn of the Big Bang that still are like this outer ring of theoretical like physics puzzles that are floating out in space somewhere. It's called the Oort Cloud and I was like that is Awesome. That That's is so cool. Rad. Of course. Yeah. There's a bunch of bands that are of course. called stuff like that. There's, yeah. Um, and then we were going to, we were thinking about trying to call ourselves animal for a while. We were like, of course that's taken. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of different variations and stuff like that. Finally, we landed on blight beast and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased with it actually. Okay. It's a, it's a sick name. I hope that that doesn't upset you to know that it has something to do with Warcraft. <laughs> Not at all. Not okay. at all. Doesn't, doesn't bother me at all. But okay. I will tell you why the one of the reasons we were so cautious is because uh, the original name for Haze Mage was um, Blood Mist, and uh, I I had pulled that band name like completely out of my butt, didn't check it at all, didn't care about it, and then like a year and a half or two years into us being a band, we got a cease and desist from this jerk off in New York City. Damn. And uh, yep, yeah, and like yeah, and it is what it is. We ended up ha changing it to Haze Mage, which is arguably a much better band name. It's got a really so, good ring to it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. The you know, way it rhymes, I think, is solid. So, you know, it, everything turned out okay. But it was really stressful at the time because we were, like, super worried. I also just had no idea that, like, when another person gives you a cease and desist, like, if it's not a major, like, company, you don't have to do what they say. Oh, like, okay. <laughs> you really, yeah, Take notes, everyone. You, you I didn't really, know that either. It's good to know. Yeah, you, you don't. I mean, you just, I mean, look, you have to weigh your risks. Obviously, if you're super worried about it, talk to a lawyer. Mm. I'm not a lawyer. Don't listen to me. But I did talk to a lawyer later about something similar. And he was like, unless you really feel like they have about 10 G's in their back pocket and they're ready to take you to court on it, tell them that you wiped your ass with the cease and desist and that you don't care. Because cool. they can't do shit otherwise. That's that's just the way that it is. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not a lawyer. Probably don't listen to me. <laughs> okay. All right. There you go. Asterisk. Asterisk. Grain of salt. Asterisk. 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 Yeah. But good to know. Good to know. Still. Um, do you have any other active music projects that we haven't mentioned? Yeah, it's. I think it's worth mentioning. Um, in October, probably in the last two weekends in Halloween night of October, I'm going to be working on a show that I pitched to the Baltimore Rock Opera Society like three or four years ago called Ceremony of the Faceless. Uh, this is going to be a 35-minute movement-focused scare attraction for the Halloween season where audience members are going to come witness this ceremony of five occult witch-type people who are also awesome movement and dancing people perform to a continuous 35-minute experimental 
uh, black metal slash ambient death metal piece that Blight Beast and a friend of ours, uh, an, a solo synth artist named uh, Elias Schulzman, who who performs under the name Revenant. Um, we're teaming up with Elias, and we're doing a 35-minute continuous metal piece that's going to accompany this movement piece that's also going to be a theatrical performance that's going to scare the living shit out of people. That sounds fucking awesome. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah, I'm. We're, oh, we were working on it last night. We're really excited. Okay, well, if people watching this, there's going to be links to all this stuff down below, so if you want to check that out, check that out. Um, uh, last thing for talking about music, you probably have some pretty cool stories from shows that you've played, just crazy moments or things that happened with any of your bands. Yeah, um, did you did you want me to like give you a, one of those? or? Yeah, because I said one last question and then didn't ask one. <laughs> 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 Keep me on my toes. Um, I mean... Completely out of nowhere, uh, Rare Candy got asked to open for Andrew WK when he was touring his solo act for Awesome Con um, in 2014. That's awesome. And we said, yeah, and we opened for Andrew WK at the Black Cat, and it was awesome. I drunkenly gushed um, over the dude backstage. I actually am like kind of embarrassed about it because I think I was being like really annoying and like that oh, stupid no. drunk asshole. Yeah, I got him to sign a poster for me. I think, he, obviously, he was super-duper nice. Um, but really monumental evening because I got to play a show opening for one of my heroes. Also conceived my child that night. Whoa. Boom. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we knew we were going to be, like, partying because we were opening for Andrew WK. So we got a hotel in D.C. And you're staying in D.C. at the hotel with your lady after you open for Andrew WK. One thing leads to another. You're making babies. <laughs> Nine years later, you have a, you know, you're a dad and you have a baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, that's a heck of a story then. Absolutely. Um, I, and I'll, I'll tell one more story. When I was touring with Entertainment System, uh, we got, we picked up a last minute gig at this, like, at this, like, 4-H hall that was run by, like, some neighborhood people in Jersey somewhere. And we went and there was like nobody there and we were super bummed about it because we like had to expend all these resources. We were mm. tired as hell. And um, like the performance just didn't go well. Like some of us had like drank too much at the time. Like we were in our 20s and our judgment wasn't really there. But we were just bummed because there was nobody at this show. And we had like went like three or four hours out of our way to go to this gig. And we were being like immature little buttholes. And um, one of my favorite bands of all time that I performed with more times than I can count, uh, P. Lander Z., was the headland uh, the headliner of this gig, and they taught me one of the my my most valuable lessons that it doesn't matter how many people come to the fucking show, just play your show and be a beast and be awesome regardless. Because I've seen them so many times, and they played the same show with the same energy at that shitty little four H club um, in front of like twelve people. The same show I saw them play in front of like. 250 or 300 people in a packed auto bar same exact show and the takeaway was like these guys are pros and they know All what right. their music is about and they understand what a show is about and i need to be more like them that's awesome uh and yeah i mean you never know like who out there has the potential to be a, a super fan like a diehard there's only 12 people there but they're there for a reason so you might, you know, catch the right person's attention. Someone that's going to like yep. buy all your merch and, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Dude, we played this street festival with Cowabunga like four or five weeks ago. Um, and there was like this 13 year old in one of in the blue cutoff tee of ours. The 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 it's got like the it says something about pizza on the front. I forget what it is. It talks. It's got like a sword cutting a pizza in half. Yeah, yeah. He's got a mohawk. Our entire set, dude, he was just out there skanking in the rain. It was freaking amazing. That's I was awesome. just like, we made it, y'all. We did it. <laughs> we did it. We, we've reached the youth. This kid gets it. We're good. We've done it right. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel yeah. like, yeah, yeah. If you have a, if you have fans that are not your age, that are younger than you, yeah, that always feels like, oh, we're doing something right. It's, yep. Yeah, especially, uh, well, playing Nintendo Core, most of what we talk about is like, old grandpa games at this point right so mm -hmm. yeah if we got if we got young people interested doing it right uh we well, did just kind of answer this but what are what are some of your own just like all-time favorite bands um i love judas priest i love weezer i'm a big fan of the fucking champs uh gosh the beastie boys uh jay-z 
Um, fucking within the ruins. What a varied uh, list. I dig it. Dude, yeah, I mean, I could keep on listing bands. I, Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, uh, Beck. I mean, yeah, like I, I could, I could keep on going for a while. The Advantage, I think, is probably one that I enjoy. Probably as far as like video game cover bands, I think that's good. That's a good list. Yeah, it's pretty solid. All right, uh, I do also normally ask like people's favorite Nintendo core bands or video gamey bands, but would I be potentially getting you in trouble if I ask you that? <laughs> no, no. Um, really good video gamey bands oh garbage masher a hundred percent yeah because like yeah i mean when it comes to covers i don't give a shit dude entertainment system is the best video game cover band that ever happened i love year 2000 x um and i love power glove uh power glove is like symphonic metal for anybody who's not uh familiar and it's really really well done but it's also like super duper clean Mm -hmm. um one thing that i the, one thing that i really liked about this place is haunted that i also like about my own band entertainment system is that like for the most part a lot of our stuff was like in the room you know what i mean it wasn't super duper overproduced yeah and that's a quality i like out of the advantage and the, and the mini bosses as well like when you listen to their stuff it's it sounds like they were all in the room together it's you know there's there's like a groove happening um but i i super duper like, as far as video game covers i stand by entertainment systems probably like you know i I was in the band, so I gotta go sign it. <laughs> no, no chance of a of a reunion or anything. No, probably not. Not for that one gotcha. or Rare Candy. Frankly, one of the core members um, just doesn't want to do it anymore at all. And we all talked about it. We were like, that without that person, like that's we're, it's not the same band, so we're not going to do it. Yeah, that's fair. It is weird yeah. when a like a key member of a band leaves and they replace them and, and keep the same name. Or, uh, it's also like, why would we like, there's the incentive for us to do it under the same name would be almost completely driven by like money would be the only reason. Like I could start another video game cover band anytime I want and name it anything, you know, yeah. like I don't need it to be entertainment system. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. That makes sense. So moving away from music, you also do visual art as ghost bat. Um, how would you describe your style and what are your influences for your visual art? Um, my style is like lots of black lines, as much black as I can get on there for the line part of it. Um, kind of busy usually is what mm. people say. There's like a lot going on. Um, it's very informed by like late eighties and nineties era horror stuff anytime i get a chance to do something with like occult imagery like zombies or bats or cobwebs or dripping candles skulls and shit like that's my jam i like that um you should make a shirt drippy. or something that says that list that you just said that ends with skulls and shit <laughs> that'd be awesome <laughs> um yeah yeah man like stuff covered in slime uh you know ha eyeballs hanging out of heads <laughs> things with fangs werewolves stuff like that but like the the video game stuff um is is definitely like a contributor think like slaughterhouse or castlevania but the the 1996 comic book by frank miller like that's that's kind of like my deal as an illustrator um i like you know i like to get like big blocky sections of black with like a lot of hatch like black lines and stuff yeah. but yeah it's 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 comic book illustration kind of rooted because that's sort of where i came from um and then you know just the video game aesthetic and i also like really like hot neon colors neon mm -hmm. greens neon pinks you know cyan blues you know things like that yeah the all of the bit gin posters i'm assuming going all the way back to the beginning i see you got the one from last year on the wall behind you there uh yep naturally you you've probably done all of those all the way back no actually there's Bit Gen 7, 5, 6, and 7 were done by contracted artists. Jimmy Gigrich, oh. who's a local artist who does stuff that's kind of in the same vein as mine, but more of, he has more of like an Adventure Time kind of okay. spin to his stuff, but it is like gory and, and like choppy. Um, and then another artist who's like a dyed-in-the-wool, like, like 
career artist who does periodical stuff mm. for like fucking Newsweek. He's a beast. Um, his name is Alex Fine, but he cut his teeth doing show posters locally. So he used, you know, I used to be able to hire him for stuff. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> but yeah, after a while, like I did the posters for the first couple of years, and I was like, eh, I should hire out some people, like just to mix things up a little bit. But I've been, I do them all myself now. Yeah, well, they're incredible. Every that's like. <laughs> my favorite i mean obviously the event is my favorite part but like whenever it gets announced like that's like one of the most hype parts is looking seeing the art that you've done for the posters so, oh thanks man for sure uh if anyone watching didn't know john did the boco boys unicorn hole shirt and right this second there's a couple of them left on our band camp so if you want to uh wear one of his awesome designs well of course you can support his own bands and stuff but uh, we love did those that. do good. Did you guys sell those? Did they? Did you move them? Yeah, we or ended up ordering a second batch because we got rid of all the first ones. So nice. Yeah, we we love that. We love that design very much. It, you captured like exactly what we wanted. So. Excellent. Do you have a like a favorite piece that you've done or a favorite? How to phrase it? Like client? Like something that you've gotten to do art for? I'm not sure what all you've who all you've provided art for. Anything that stands out specially to you? I mean, I, I do D&D, like, party, like, we've been playing a and d campaign for three years, and now we wanted to pay somebody, like, 500 bucks to do a poster image of our D&D party to culminate the last three years of this experience we had. Every once in a while, I agree to do one of those. They're, they're really labor-intensive because mm. you have to look at these, like, insane lists of, like, this is a six-foot-two dragonborn fighter with blue eyes and tendril hair that's bronze, and they have a signet ring with two eyes and a bat on it, and la la la. Like it's it's all this stuff you have to do. But every once in a while, I do one of those, and usually those come out really good because like I fuck with D and D, and I want to like be respectful to what these people are expecting out of this piece because mm -hmm. it's it's they usually like print it out in a poster and give it to everybody, or they make it for the DM or something like that. Um, but I would say probably the piece that I'm proudest of in recent years, I did this idea for MAGFest. The year that MAGFest got canceled when it was themed after Doom, they hired me to do the badges. And I was like, okay, cool. I want to do a panoramic where it's going to be this giant battle scene with all of these original characters they all created that are like Doom adjacent, but styled after MAGFest. And the performer's badge is going to be one side. And the attendees' badge is going to be, or you know, the staff and performers' badge is going to be one side. The attendees' badge mm. is going to be the other. And when you put them together, it's going to make this panoramic image. And I really like shot for the stars with it. it like, I think it turned out awesome. Of course, that's the year that Magfest got canceled. Um, but the following year, when I went, when they opened it back up and people were masked up for it, Adam Adam Chase, uh, the dude who runs fundraising for Magfest, he had gotten the whole thing uh, completely. I had no idea they did. This. He had the whole thing printed up on this giant like. 12 by 8 Hell like yeah. spandex like wall that they just had up in the game room and i was like oh this is sweet That's so awesome. I, I took a picture next to that but yeah that piece turned out really good and sort of like changes change things up for some of the things i do stylistically and like messing around with with new things with uh with procreate and yeah it was just like a big piece that ended up turning out really cool awesome uh, you mentioned D and D. Uh, what what race and class? What is your character? I gotta know. Oh, I'm playing a campaign right now. I'm playing a war forged, fathomless warlock named Bo Hullix. Nice. Um, yeah. Who's your patron? Uh, Bo is my patron. Is uh, oh my gosh, I am drawing a blank right now because see, okay, so you have to understand. I found out who my patron was like halfway through the campaign because my dude came from the realm of water and my memory was wiped because I floated around in a void of wetness for like 500 years because warforged are basically like <laughs> yeah. immortal they don't have to eat or breathe um so it's it's this it's this giant tentacle monster that lives in the realm of water and i can't fucking remember i can't pull its name right now i have it written down my character sheet is right here here look i'll show you on the video you can see my character oh hell yeah there's a lot of glare though there's yeah i do artwork for everybody in the campaign and Damn, uh, too bad you're so far away. Yeah, dude, I would be down to do a one shot if time allowed. Um, my 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 patron's whole deal is that it's an eldritch horror that lives underwater, and its whole thing is that it wants everything to be underwater, okay, all the time. Yeah, so I'm supposed to be like this, this like this little droplet 
landing in this new realm where I where I showed up, and uh, I'm I'm basically going to be like the entryway to my patron delivering all of this like flood terror onto this new plane of existence, and like low key, I'm trying to figure out how to murder my patron. Actually, oh okay, that's pretty sick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been DMing and playing D and D for. Uh, probably like 20 years at this point. So I had to ask, uh, hell yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, right. DMing is super fun. I ran a campaign for like a year and a half back in the day, back during 4.5. Okay. Um, and I've, I've recently gotten back into, into actually playing the game. I got to play our, uh, I played my other character for, I'm in an improv comedy D and D thing called who's rolls it anyway, that performs at Magfest. Um, and we also do a couple smaller events throughout the year. Um, but I play this character named Pierogi the Rogi. He's a gnome. <laughs> He's a rogue. I love it. It's all comedy. It's all made up. There's no rules. I finally actually, like, I needed to do a one-shot to teach one of my buddies how to play because he was going to join our party. Hmm. And I wrote Pierogi as a character, and I got I got to play a gnome rogue, and it was freaking awesome. <laughs> it nice. was, like, it was the best. Are there, like, videos of this, or is it just a live-only thing? Oh no, there's there's videos of who's roll. Okay, cool. Well, there, we'll I'll a, put there's that there's down there too. Episodes. Yeah, there's podcast episodes poking around somewhere. Okay, awesome. Uh, anything else you wanted to say about Ghost Bat before I move to the next thing? Um, I you know I'll take commissions if you give me like a month's notice and you can meet my starting rate, then talk to me. Also, um, hire living artists, even if it's not me. AI is for lazy losers. He does good stuff. Uh, we can vouch he's easy to work with and he even recommended you might have even placed the order I don't remember you helped us out with actually getting them produced as well so big sure. yeah, su yeah. super appreciate that and I don't know if I told you this now I'm just like throwing a free ad in for sage printing but um, we got when I told you we ordered a second batch we priced a bunch of stuff around here and we couldn't find a place cheaper here without shipping than sage would be to rerun them and ship them so we got the second batch from sage so, yeah dude yeah they do great work yeah recommend recommend them and they've always been like easy to get in touch with and everything so absolutely so you mentioned it at the beginning you're also uh what do i have here game director slash creative guy at terrible games tell us what terrible games is yeah, so um, Terrible Games is an independent board game publishing company that I run, and uh, to date we have uh, like 12 unique titles that we put out, um, but to be fair, our first release, Token Terror's Battlegrounds, consisted of six unique solo games and then a one versus one like small box war game that we made. Uh, and then we went on to do an original RPG called Repugnant, the world's most disgusting TTRPG. Um, Black Mold, a two to five player survival horror escape game where your turn lasts as long as you can hold your breath. <laughs> Our most recent release, Volca, which is a one to five player card clasher that breaks all the rules. And um, we're currently cooking up a couple new things. I'm going to try to go back to crowdsourcing pretty soon with Token Terror Season 2, which is going to introduce seven new factions to the Fracas. Um, but yeah, it's like, yeah, this whole month, like actually squeezing in this interview was like a thing that I had to like weigh a little bit because um, I'm in between, like I did an event last weekend. I went to max talk last weekend. It was super fun. Um, and then I'm doing a smaller event this Saturday. And then like f the following Tuesday, I'm driving out to Ohio for six days. And then I have another show in Philly the last weekend of this month. So June is just all board game shit the whole month. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's uh, when I asked you about it, I was like, damn dude, John's so busy, but that didn't surprise me at all because as I've said, you do so much stuff. So. Yeah. But yeah, but part of doing so much stuff and helping to promote BitGen, which is another job I have, which is making sure people know about it. And you've already lent us a bunch of support by doing coverage about the show and doing like, you know, post show, uh, like BitGen is freaking cool and you should go. Like, right. I love that's, I, I super appreciate that. That's super good stuff. So when you asked me to come on and be like, hey, can you do a podcast and do it with enough time so that we can run promo for BitGen? I'm like, I have to show up. That's, that's the, that's the gig. Like, and you and me get to hang out. So that's an added bonus. That's right. Uh, so okay, black mold. I gotta, I gotta revisit that. Your turn lasts as long as you can hold your breath. I remember reading that. You, you had any like David Blaine assholes come in that hold their breath for like three minutes while you're testing it or anything? No, I mean that wouldn't matter anyway. Um, because the game has like mechanical rails that'll end your turn regardless of how long you can hold your breath. 
Okay. But the thing is, is like what what the hold your breath mechanism is supposed to do is thematically it fits with the theme of the game because in the game you're in the bottom most room of a subterranean prison compound and the the room that you're in and the prisoners in there with you just happens to be the last room that is untouched by this invading undulating black and fungal growth that is coating the subterranean hallways of this entire co- every corridor that you have to go through in order to exit. And when you open the door, like the, the way that we frame the game is like this person who's like emaciated that you thought is pretty much dead. Like they basically wriggle out of their confines and they open the door to escape and they usher in this cloud of black smoke that they immediately inhale and you watch them collapse and die in front of you. So you're like, okay, I can't breathe whatever the hell that is. So the only way I'm going to get out of here alive is if I limit my exposure. So you have to hold your breath to get out of the corridor, to get out of the compound alive. So there's that. But then in the game, we're basically hitting you with these very simple, approachable, but cognitive load bombarding micro puzzles that cause you to panic and cause you to act on intuition instead of calculation. So as long as you like understand the flow of the game, like there's a bunch of other stuff that happens outside of the inhale and exhale step of your turn, Mm -hmm. Um, like threatening other players or trading stuff with other players or heal trying to heal yourself like there's a couple other things and this is a loosely rpg adjacent experience um but at a certain point in your turn you're going to take a deep breath you're going to hold it and during that time you're going to be able to do two things you're going to flip over cards from your unique prisoner deck of decision cards to make a continuous tableau of these neural path cards that are all this array of zigzags and lines and stuff Um, And you do that with one hand while holding your breath. And every time you complete a certain amount of those for the area that you're in, you get to move out of that area and reveal a new one and expand the compound and escape. Or you can roll survival dice and search for items. And each area has a number on it. If it says three, you're going to roll survival dice equal to... uh, There's some stats on this card that you have plus a base number of two dice. You're going to roll all the dice. As soon as you have an outcome, the needed outcome that matches the number on that card, you get to draw an item card. You can do either of these things as much time, as many times as you want, provided you don't run out of cards, you don't run out of breath. And then anytime you enter another ro- a new room for the first time, you're going to draw a plot card. And uh, roughly 35% of the plot cards are going to end your turn automatically because okay. one of them generates fungal thralls that attack you and when they show up your turn immediately ends the other one is uh plot cards which also immediately end your turn and you have to read this like story point with this little scene out to the rest of the table um the other one is a madness card which you can actively ignore so like you can hold your breath for five minutes straight eventually you're gonna run out of cards or you're gonna enter a room with a that's gonna trigger a plot card like one of those things is gonna happen Super awesome idea, though. And the the setting and stuff, as you've described it, sounds very cool. You can, I mean, uh, it feels like, so like I said, that I've been playing D&D for a long time. It feels like the kind of thing that, like, if you're not ready to play the next session that day or if the DM needs a break or whatever, it sounds like a really good thing for, like, a a crunchy D&D group to get into for, it sounds like something you could play in a single day, right? Like, learn the rules and play a few times. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, like, um, I mean, I'll warn you, like, straight up, I'll be transparent. Like, the rule booklet wasn't as good as I thought it was, apparently. Um, We have a bunch of scores on BGG that are, like, 8.5s, 9s, you know, you know, 9.5s. There are people who love it. There are also people who are giving it, like, 1s and 4s and stuff because there's a couple issues with people comprehending the rule booklet. They're having trouble with it. And there's a bunch of factors that can inform that. But I've heard from a lot of people that um, if someone else who knows the game teaches it to them, it's always a really positive experience. Yeah. If they have to unpack the rule booklet and actually go through the very, you know, I tried to be very thorough and detailed so that every single question they might have can be found in the rule booklet. Um, but it, I guess it is like a little bit granular and a little bit too dense for people to actually like leaf through to get through every single thing. So. You know, I don't. I can't really explain the disconnect uh, for every individual, but um, definitely like watch some playthrough videos online, and or you know, holler at me or watch any of the videos that we made before you get it to the table. But absolutely, this is a game that like it plays twenty to thirty minutes per player. I think that it's a really awesome group experience at three or four players. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's a super ambitious game, but like I'm I'm super proud of it. For sure. Well, you you beat me too. I was going to say, like, is there, you know, a video that people could watch to kind of get a head start on the rules? But of course, you've got that worked mm-hmm. out. Yeah. 
Uh, I like the gimmick too because there's the thing like I think a lot of people do it when you're watching a movie or TV show or something and someone goes underwater and you like instinctively hold your breath to see if you can yes yeah make it for the whole scene that's what it kind of made me think of so. that's it's funny you mentioned that because when we were play testing the very very rough initial concept of this game like hand drawn on cardstock version of this game and it was just me and the co-designer Phil Dacolo. Um we both found that we were involuntarily holding our breath during the other person's turn that's and awesome. that like was an immediate indicator that we, we like had something you yeah. know <laughs> that's cool uh anything else you wanted to mention about terrible games uh if you go to token com and you want to purchase any of our stuff you can order almost everything that i mentioned uh volka is currently available for pre-order through the pledge manager everything else um is available for purchase and will ship within two days okay awesome all right so let's finally move on to bitgen um for some weirdo who's watching who doesn't know what bitgen is explain the explain it basically to us bitgen gamer fest is a annual music festival that happens here in baltimore maryland where over the course of one day where doors open at about 3 p.m and then it doesn't end until around 12:30 at night. We have two stages where we feature like the thumping cutting edge pulse of the video game music scene that we can get to perform in one day. It's usually between 16 and 18 bands and we do a ping ponging schedule where there's a downstairs stage and an upstairs stage. And at any given time of day, there is no downtime. You, if you want to see music performed live, you can do that the entire day. Um, we do food trucks. All the bands hang out and sell merch and sign stuff and talk to people and perform. Um, and it's like a super awesome event. And everybody has a good time. And there's two bars. And also we do arcade games. We have free play arcade games. There's pinball. And we and we bring in a curated selection of console games as well, and that people can play. I, I love that bit. Yeah, you go you go upstairs in the in like the main pit area, and then there's like Super Nintendos and 64 set up up there. Uh, mm -hmm. John mentioned it earlier, but anyone who doesn't know, on this YouTube channel, there's a video that I posted from like I went to Bitgen. That would have been what 2022. And just had such a good time, I wanted to make a video about it. And so there's a video on this channel just gushing about how cool BitGen is. And then the following <laughs> year, which was last year we played, and we're playing again this year, along with a lot of other cool bands. But before we talk about this year, uh, tell me about the beginnings of BitGen. What was the first you know, one and first couple of them like? Sure. So um, it actually kind of started... So I was in Entertainment System, and... I was cruising around MySpace like you do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I saw this event called 8-Bit Armageddon that was happening in State College, PA, and was run by this band called This Place is Haunted. And they had, like, three bands on the bill, and they were billing it as, like, an art show that had a bunch of 8-bit, you know, Nintendo-era, like, video game-inspired artwork. And then these three video game-adjacent bands were going to perform, and they billed it as, like, this thing, 8-Bit Armageddon. And I reached out to them and was like you should have our band play also because this looks really cool and we would like, we would drive out there and do it and we're a good band too. So we should play. And, um, they were like, we can't really pay you. I was like, that's fine. Like, we just want to come out and play more shows with more and do more stuff. So, uh, I think they did end up paying us actually. I think it was like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks or something like that. Cause they're nice guys, but we went out. It was awesome. It was super fun. Cut to a few months later. It's almost summertime. I'm in Baltimore working at a coffee shop. This guy named Dan Stupenagel, he owns a studio space in this like rundown warehouse called Load of Fun Studios. And I guess he got control of the building and was supposed to like do stuff in it. <laughs> and he was coming by the coffee shop all the time and saw me like sketching and we like were chatting and became pals. And he was like, hey man, if you ever want to put on a rock concert, I can do it upstairs at Load of Fun Studios. So let me know. And I was like, okay cool i'm gonna borrow the model that we have from 8-bit armageddon but i'm gonna do it bigger i'm gonna get 8-bit artists uh this guy who i know from from myspace also who did pixel paintings and we're gonna get a handful of other uh you know video game visual artists and we're gonna get uh temps 
Sound Solutions, Power Glove, uh, Entertainment System, Armadillo Tank. We got a bunch of like locals and, and some other, you know, video game cover bands. And we did this event. Freaking Overclock Remix came out and covered the event. They Dude. did this little mini documentary that like went moderately viral where they shot this like really awesome thing. I can't find it anywhere. Oh, no. If anybody knows where it is. Yeah. Dude, it's like. It's a time capsule of the video where they show the first, um, the first, oh my gosh, it was called, uh, eight bit genocide at the time. And again, this is, this speaks to what we were talking about earlier where right. I was just like lackadaisically like, oh, what's, what's bat more badass than an Armageddon <laughs> a fucking genocide. So we're going to call this eight bit genocide. Didn't give it a second thought, not even comprehending that. Like, yeah, that's pretty fucking offensive. So like, <laughs> um, the the other earlier years were kind of the same deal, um, except for that after Load of Fun the first year, we were like, especially after the little like OCR remix documentary thing came out, we were like, oh, this is like pretty legit. Like we're gonna do this every year, and um, cool. So this upcoming the, the next year we're gonna go to a new venue. So we started doing it at this place called the Creative Alliance, which worked out really good for a couple years, um, and we started getting bands like Anna Monaguchi, the Proto Men. Um, you know, Power Glove came back a number of years. Uh, I mean, like, it's a murderer's row of the video game cover scene. And, mm -hmm. like, a lot of the larger bands that you may have heard of throughout the years who are now doing, like, international tours and are big names, like, they all have most likely played BitGen at some point. That's awesome. Um, it is kind of cool. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Um, so, after Load of Fun Studios, we did a show at Autobar. Uh, and I think that was the first year that we had the Megas come out, if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, yeah, they do, they do like Mega Man covers, but they also write original vocals and they also perform under a band called the Belmonts. Those guys are our buddies. We get to tour with them a couple times. Um, and yeah, it just kind of, it just kind of kept going. And it also turned into like an album release thing for entertainment system for a number of years, because like we, we were just on this tear where like we had just planned to put out a new album at each bit gen so that we could really capitalize on like that focused audience and that level of interest being in one place at one time like Smart. it is it, you probably know this you know this better than most people like being in a video game band like you can play shows with thrash metal bands or you know indie rock bands or whatever it is and like they're fun shows and there's usually a handful of people who are like yo that was badass i love it let me buy a shirt la, la, la. it's not the same as when you go to a, a show that's like a bunch of dorks Man. like <laughs> that's yeah, those are the ones where you're just like really in your element and it's a little it just hits a little different. So yeah, like it was both like an annual event where we got to see all of our buddies and perform to a really like awesome audience. We also just turned it into album release shows because it like made sense. For sure. So how did when and how did uh Magfest become part of Bitgen? So uh Dominic Secretti who plays keyboards in Rare Candy, or used to play keyboards in Rare Candy when that was still a thing. Uh, right around, like... Okay, so one of the years we did, I want to say BitGen 8. 6. BitGen 6. I Got just note the back poster. there. Yeah. Um, BitGen Gamer... So we... Okay. When we took the show to Creative Alliance, we took to, we went to them, we were like, all right, we're going to bring you this show, and it's called 16-Bit Genocide. And they were like... You guys can do it, but you need to change the name. And we were like, okay, we're just going to change it to Bit Gen because that kind of sounds like you're saying bitchin' and it's the bit generation. So we'll just l lose the aside and keep the rest. So it was it, then it was permanently changed after that. Um, but it, at Bit Gen 6, we moved to this venue called Bourbon Street that was only open for a couple years here in Baltimore. And it had two stages and two rooms next to each other. And it was fucking amazing it was so awesome when you walked into either of these rooms there was bars on the left and right and you would rock right by them into the main stage so we had um i'm just going to list off the lineup for that particular year metroid metal x hunters uh random the one ups year 2000 x arm cannon entertainment system rear candy the descendants of Erdrick, the proto men bit brigade uh cheap dinosaurs ice cap assault parental floss random battles dj Cutman. that was the that was the lineup for that one. And, um, the hell of a lineup after, yeah, hell of a lineup after that one, Dom Secretti, who was basically like the dude sort of calling the shots for Magfest at the time was like, 
there's a lot of like financial overhead that comes with this show. This show is obviously freaking awesome. You guys need like support. You need financial support and marketing support. So here's what we're going to do. I want to kind of do what I did with MAGFest, which was Dom was around during the transitional phase for MAGFest when like around MAGFest 8, MAGFest 9, it was getting, the event was getting really big for its britches and he helped transition them into the Gaylord Hotel and the event that it is now with 20,000 people. It used to be like three or 4,000 people and it, and it stayed at that size for many years. And then Dom was part of this you know, group of people that transitioned into this huge event. And he tried to kind of do the same thing with BitGen. And for like two years, we tried to do it at Power Plant Live, this really big like corporate venue. And uh, we lost money, which was like fine because it was MAGFest money. You know, I, I, it was like, it was, you know, it wasn't great. But like the, the, the shows we did there were awesome. Uh, we just never really like, it didn't really have the feeling that I wanted, which, you know, some of my favorites were the ones that we did at Autobar because I love the Autobar. Yeah. And after like two years with it not really working, I was like, I'm going to like, I'm going to do what I want to do again. And I, I just like, I want to take it back to Autobar. And until we like sell it out two years in a row where it's like people at the door getting turned away, mm -hmm. um, we're just going to keep doing it at Autobar forever. And the event is like capped right now. You know, we always get like this close to being at that point, but we never have gotten to the point where people are like, where we're just like, it's completely sold out and you can't come in the building. So, um, get on you know, that. uh, People, yeah, I mean that watching. might happen. We, yeah, like, well, here's the thing also for BitGen that I don't think a lot of people realize is like just the performing acts alone is like a hundred people. Damn. Like, yeah, <laughs> I didn't think yeah, about 16, that. Yeah, sixteen bands in the building. That's like a hundred people right there. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, but but at that point, Dom had already like kind of intertangled BitGen with Magfest. And we had worked out a system where, like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I have it on pretty good authority. Like, BitGen was listed as part of their 401c3 nonprofit application because, like, what BitGen provides is, like, a cultural event that enriches and promotes the video game music culture. Like, that's, that's awesome. pretty much all it does. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's like a big box that needs to get checked for them to meet their mission as a nonprofit. Um, and they do make things really easy for me because like I don't have to either like self finance stuff for things that require upfront overhead. Mm -hmm. And also like they help out with the marketing stuff and they help me out with like live streaming and getting sound, you know, engineer people to come help out and you know, media coverage and all kinds of stuff. So it's a good partnership. And, you know, in the meantime we have like this cool, you know, homecoming basically where like all these VGM heads and all these like chiptune people and all these people like Nintendo core and all these huge nerds, like all get to come and hang out and party for a day. Hell yeah. Uh, do you have like a favorite set or moment from a past bit, Jen? One that really stands out? Yeah. That, that, that bourbon street set when entertainment system performed, um, Dom's girlfriend, Erica and Dom himself, we performed one song as super entertainment system with two keyboards added. And I don't remember the exact track, but we performed this absolutely batshit fucking crazy final fantasy cover. That was like six minutes long. Damn. <laughs> and we learned it for the, yeah, we learned it for the show and we performed it and it was like, it was monstrous, dude. It was so huge. Um, yeah. I just remember that, that set like being capped with that performance and it feeling really, really great. How far back are they documented? I know you mentioned the first one was, but you can't find it, right? I'm, so the, the OCR remix thing was like a full-on like 22 or 25 minute long like doc. It was yeah. like a mini doc. Okay. Um, there's like little videos and stuff of people who like film from the audience poking around, but we don't have like cut together edited coverage. Um, you'll also see some stuff with like, you know, folks who are like, we're a podcast or we're like a media group who covers video game music or nerd culture or whatever it is. So that sometimes you'll get like a thing where it's like these two dudes who have some microphones doing like a backroom interview mm. with a, a band at Bit Gen, some stuff like that. But there isn't like, you know, great photography or video, like, uh, you know, archival stuff from each of these shows, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. I know that some individuals were doing some of that last year, uh, recording sets that they were able to. Yeah. 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 We, we, 
and the the MacFest Mediatron has come out and like done live streams a couple years, but they can't always commit people to it every year, unfortunately. Yeah, makes sense. Um, do you have any like dream gets artists that you haven't been able to get to Bitgen, but that you would love to have come out? Yes, uh, the advantage because they don't play anymore. Um, you know, I don't. I, we'll never get them because they don't play. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they're yeah. just they're done as a band. But those guys are like the original OG video game cover band, mm-hmm. and th- those would be the guys. I was this close to getting the mini bosses last year. Damn. Um, and you know, for my part, like, I think the mini bosses are pretty good. I would like to have them on the show because they're one of the they're one of the longest playing groups ever in the game. From what I understand, like of the original members, I think it's just Aaron, the bass player, and I think his son is playing drums for them now, hmm. or maybe their son is playing guitar. Um, but you know, for them, you know, it's like, yeah, I remember being like, oh wow, like video game, like cover rock and roll is like a thing. And it was like the mini bosses. Right. And it was like this really neat, like novel kind of thing. So those guys definitely like deserve credit where due. Um, I'd, I'd like to get them and sidebar, even though they played bit gen twice, I'd love to get Anna Monaguchi back because I love what Mm -hmm. they do. And, like, I just haven't been able... Every time I, I run into them every once in a while, and I'm like, will you guys please come back? They're like, yeah, absolutely. We'd love to come back. And they're like, you have to talk to our agent. And I'm like, fuck, man. <laughs> <laughs> As I've, I've tried to reach out to them, and I know that their agency stuff has moved around a little bit. If, if for some reason any of their guys hear this, like, reach out to me and straighten me out if I'm wrong. But I've had trouble reaching them. I have trouble getting them booked again. Uh, I'd love to have them come out. Okay. Yeah, I see when when you're asking about bands that people want like posts with Bitgen that Anamaguchi um, tends to come up. But yeah, I mean they're dude, they're a great group. The Scott Pilgrim soundtrack is really good, but their original yeah. work is also freaking bonkers and a lot of fun. So, the advantage were I I don't have a good timeline in my head. I mean, back at the beginning of Bitgen, surely they were around still active then, right? Yeah, but like I I'd seen them perform twice, but you know they're from California, okay. and thinking about reaching at the time when BitGen was active and they were playing, like it would have never crossed my mind that we would be able to get them. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Like it just, and I think that actually, like shortly after, I felt like we had enough of an event where I could maybe coax them out. Um, even then, while they were still a band, we weren't spo- we weren't like financially pillowed by MAGFest. Right. So like if the advantage existed right now, I could confidently reach out to them and go, how much do you guys want to perform back then in 2008 or 2009, we were self-financing. So we couldn't just reach out to any band we want and be like, how much will it be? Because we can only ever pay them after the gig is over. You know? Right. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, people that are watching right now that are just like you whole fans are probably also fans of blind equation. So I wanted to ask how you, uh, how did, how did that happen? He's blind equation is playing this year at Bitgen. How did that mm-hmm. come to be? TikTok. Oh yeah. I'm not, uh, you know, <laughs> I just be cruising. I, I be cruising on TikTok, and I do, you know, my feed does occasionally get sprinkled with some chip tune stuff and, um, you know, other stuff from live music. And I, I try to make it a habit, even if it's just like, you know, some, some lady sitting on her bed, plucking out a bass part. I'll drop a like on that. You know, anybody yeah. who's trying to make music or do stuff with music, I'm always like, let me show you a little bit of support or say good job or whatever. Um, so my feed sometimes gets hit with some cool stuff. And yeah, I, I saw, I saw like maybe one video of blind equation. I was like, Oh, this is cool. I saw another one. And then I, I saw like two or three and it was like these guys and I could hear like the cyber grind chip doing stuff going on in the back. But more importantly, it's always just these huge circle pits yeah. in front of them the whole time. And then and the dudes on stage just like going absolutely ape shit. And I was like, man, I got to reach out and just see what these guys deal. So I went and I saw that they were like from Chicago. I was like, they might do it. Like Chicago's not that far. Uh, so I reached out and they were like down to perform. So yeah, I'm, I'm really psyched to see their set, man. I'm, I think it's going to be cool. Yeah. Same. We've been, I mean, in, in mostly the same circles. And so once you whole started playing live, it felt inevitable that we'd play with them eventually. So super stoked that that's happening at bit I didn't see that coming, but I'm, we're, we're hyped about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Sort of like my, my thing also, and I don't know if you like picked up on this. 
uh, like Cowabunga isn't playing I all of the like that. mainstay locals that have played. Yeah. A lot like steel samurai and random battles. And uh, that's actually those three bands have played consistently every year for like the last four or five years. And you know, I, these are all people who I love dearly. Like mm. they're all, like a lot of them are like some of my closest friends. Um, and obviously like Cowabunga is my own fucking band. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like this year, like I want to make room to just like, have more new bands in and just like have bit gen be associated with um like the video game music event that is like on the cutting edge like okay. we're staying current we're seeing like where the scene is going and where the video game music like genre how it's spreading and what it's mutating into we need to find stuff like that and bring more of that in, into the fold if you look at like uh, a good example did you happen to catch anything last year from um optimus chad oh v- very much so yes we're uh yes dude yeah right yeah yeah he's awesome uh, super, yeah super cool stuff like that kind of stuff stuff that's like a little less esoteric kind of weird fucking mm-hmm. cool you know i mean what's like the whole shrek thing with the luchador mask and just like the you know really grindy like super quick uh what is the genre i mean it's chip tune but like chip thrash i guess or chip core because it's pretty like breakdown yeah, as far as like the composition goes like chuggy almost it's like I don't want to call it power violence because he's not talking about doing violent stuff, but the musical style is very like aggressive. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, stuff, m- more stuff like that, you mm-hmm. know, more stuff that's like on the edge, man. <laughs> okay. We, um, you hole and some other bands did an online show in April and, uh, we invited Chad to participate in that. He wasn't able to, but he did record like a couple little cameo videos and, um, we it was hinted pretty heavily in that, but I'll like officially confirm you hole and him are gonna do a split together, and that's because of you. Because wheat, yeah, we never heard of him before, but yeah, last year we saw him and we're just like, this dude's fucking hilarious. This music's awesome. Let's do something with him. So, dude, that's great. To, I I'm glad that I played a small role in in facilitating that. That's awesome news. Yeah, no no small role. I wouldn't say. Uh, so well, I mean, you know, I just I you put you guys in the same room. That's you know. Well, I mean, that room is far away from our house, so getting us to go to that room is <laughs> <laughs> something. Uh, anything else you want to mention about BitGen before I ask some other questions? Um, it's an all-ages show. You know, bring the young ones if they're down to party. You know, people usually are really cool and chill. Mm-hmm. We have a food truck if you get hungry. And um, if you're a person who wants to be in a video game type of band or a chip tune band or something like that. And you're kind of thinking about like how you could maybe break in or get yourself sort of wiggled into the scene. BitGen is like a good event to just attend and come to. You'll get to see a lot of things and you'll get to meet some cool people and it's a good time all around. Come out, get tickets. They're on sale. Big agree. Like I said, I've we the time that I went as a patron, like I got off work on Friday and we drove up there. We got there to the, our hotel at like three a.m. and went to sleep and then got up at whatever. Not very much. I think like four or five hours later and went and spent some time in Ellicott. I think is what it's called, a little town yep. nearby. And then went to Bitgen mm-hmm. and then drove home on Sunday. We made a weekend trip out of it with like I don't know fourteen hours worth of driving, but worth it if if whenever you don't invite us back i'll still be there so (laughs) thanks dude for sure uh so video games are obviously like half of the equation of bit gen um what are some of your all-time favorite video games mario kart double dash smash brothers melee resident evil 4 (sighs) animal crossing mario 64 tekken 3 um not the gamecube games at the start there I, because i fuck with gamecube hardcore dude i love the gamecube i think it's the best system to ever come out the controller is unrivaled and i absolutely there's never yes. yeah there's not a better controller that's ever come out Preach. Preach. the form factor of it the durability of it the dude. memory cards i mean wave birds uh, uh, they were ahead of the game on everything it was the best system that came out it was like the dreamcast but it just kept it was actually successful yeah. you know um uh, on that note, I'm going to drop Soul Calibur okay. 2. 2 was the GameCube one. 
Yeah. With Link. <laughs> 2 was the GameCube one. <laughs> yeah, with Link. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, oh, fucking Wario's Woods. I really like uh, Kirby's Dream Course. I'm a big fan. Uh, and Yoshi's Island. Super Mario Land 2, Yoshi's Island. Not Super Mario Land 2, sorry. World 2? Super Mario World Super Mario 2. World. Yeah. But I do like Super Mario Land 2 on the Game Boy. It's another really good one. Um, yeah, that's going to be like my top 15 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Solid list. I like how you just spouted them off. You also mentioned my all-time favorite game, which is kind of a zag, because my top like 20 would be nothing but like first-party Nintendo games, except my number one favorite game ever is Resident Evil 4. Right, because that's every that anybody with a half a brain would probably have that in their top three at least, and even with the fucked controls on the GameCube, where like mm. everything was kind of jilted on the movement until they did the remaster, it still was freaking amazing. It was still so good. I think I beat that game like forty times on the GameCube, and then when the Wii version came out, I was like, oh, I guess I'll do it again now, forty more times. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, in all honesty, I think I've probably beaten it all together like a dozen times. And then I, I, I completed the Mercenaries mode mm. and then went through the whole thing with just Bazooka, which was super fun. Yeah, uh, <laughs> You earn it. <laughs> Once you get the new Game Plus, you've earned the right to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah dude. Just Bazooka the whole time. <laughs> Fucking, I love that game. Did you play the remake? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What you And think? I was like, oh, they, that was good. I mean... They fixed the controls, you know? They made it so that you are you can strafe. Yeah. <laughs> you know? The, um, the only thing at all in the remake that I just was like, not even like a negative, I just, the cutscenes, because I've played the original one so much, I can freaking talk along with the entire game, like all the cutscenes and stuff, because mm-hmm. they're so cheesy. I love them. Uh, never skip them. The, like the yeah. remake, it's like the script is the same. Like they're saying the the same thing, but with different words. It's like they just rewrote each line, and it was just like mm. uncanny to me. I was like, "Why did you do that? Why did you? If you were gonna change it, why didn't you change it?" But did you do the thing where you hit the save point before the Krauser knife fight on the catwalk, and then you watched all the different death scenes against Krauser? Absolutely. And then- go back and then just make it a little bit further mm-hmm. in the cutscene, you know, where it had the live react, like button commands with the swipes and everything. Yeah, dude, the quick time that part was no crucial. Of course. God, dude, that game's insane. That part where there's that giant, like the little boy, but he's <laughs> like a giant robot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got a statue, he's like, a giant robot statue of himself. Why wouldn't he? Yep. Yeah. 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 That makes total sense. Dude, the gnarliest death in the game is the, the Novistadors, the bug enemies. Uh, if you get mm-hmm. grabbed by them and you just don't do the QTE, you just sit there like an asshole, they'll puke on your face and it melts Leon's face off and like the skin comes off and the meat's like flapping back and stuff. It's oh super gnarly, but it's easy to miss because those enemies are like pretty easy. Yeah, okay. Fuck. Dude, I'll send to it to you. I'll send it again. It's probably about time. Yeah, it's probably about time. Uh, I'll send you that. I'll send you that video on YouTube. You got to see that one. It's awesome. Yeah, I'll check it out. I'm so stoked that you mentioned that game. You're the first person that I've asked their favorite games who's mentioned Resident Evil Four. So. Oh yeah. So that that list that I rifled off, like Mario sixty four, Resident Evil Four, and Tekken Three, are probably my top three. Damn. Okay. I would think we need to bring I a think. Resident Evil Four song to Bit Gen then. Dude, go. I, God, what would that even be? We well, you hold does have a Resident Evil Four song, uh, from the perspective of the merchant. It's called Stranger Danger. It's on Songs Unsung from like 2014. Sweet. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I I immediately went like, what would be a cover song? Oh oh, from Resident hmm. Evil, but like, there I don't know. Yeah, most of the music's pretty do. like minimal, spooky ambient. Yeah, so. yeah. Unless you wanted to do like the bongos from the island, but that might be a little weird. Um, okay. Were you ever a big Pokemon fan? Yeah, I love Pokemon. All right, so I always ask this question as well: Pokemon are real? We're in a magic. We're in the Pokemon world. You get to have six in your team. You can just pick them. Yeah. The only rule is if you if you want a legendary, you can only have one. So, what is your team gonna be? Snorlax, Arcanine, Gengar, um, Electike, uh, Delibird. Got one more. Metagross. Okay. 
awesome. Oh, and there's a fourth, that's fourth gen, I think, right? Metagross? Yeah. Feel, feel psychic, I think. Or just regular steel. That sounds right. You, you, at first I was like, is he going to go all gen one? And then you started to branch out a little bit and then you threw in a fourth gen at the end there. I think yeah. fifth well, gen's about, maybe sixth gen's about the last one that I was uh, I mean, super There's a into. lot of really cool new ones I just, I'm not familiar with, but I have my reasons for the other ones, but obviously like, Get I was that. in, I was in high school when Pokemon came out and I still was just like, yo, this shit is fucking bad, son. I love this. Hell yeah. uh, <laughs> and I watched the cartoon and stuff. Yeah. I was playing, I was playing the Game Boy games and everything. Uh, but I actually, I remember the first game I ever designed was a dice based Pokemon battle game because I had the Pokemon toys. Do you remember the little Pokemon toys that came in the Pokeball? Yeah. There were the little plastic, like Pikachu and Butterfree and and uh, Bulbasaur and Charmander. So we would do the thing. We'd like throw them out. And I had this little dice game, and I had a little notebook with like stats and everything. We would level them up and shit. That's awesome. Um, that was like the first like board game I ever made. Okay. Uh, so Snorlax, yeah, dude, your yeah. favorite? I I I picked Snorlax because um, I look like Snorlax, <laughs> and okay. that was like. Uh, Snorlax sleeps. He's super powerful. Uh, generally, the attitude of Munchlax, as depicted in the cartoon, seems to really resonate with me as a person. Um, I like Arcanine because, to me, Arcanine is the ultimate Pokemon to choose as your buddy. Okay. Because he starts off as like a super cute little dog that's also a tiger but can also breathe fire. And then later he's that again but just looks <laughs> more badass and is the size of a horse. And you see Ash fucking riding that Sorry. thing in the opening credits and it's like dude how badass is that to be best friends with a fire tiger that's the size <laughs> of a horse that you can ride well stated like doesn't get any cooler than that um yeah and then Gengar is just like an icon you know i mean let's be real i you know i feel like i'd want to put jigglypuff on that list maybe Gengar and jigglypuff are both like top five for me as well I think yeah, the last the puff and smash. The puff and smash is just such such a force. I heard there's <laughs> going to be a song about that at Bit Bit Gen this year. Yes, <laughs> dude. Yes. <laughs> um, I think the uh, Chris Finn, the previous guest, I think he listed Arcanine as well as one of his favorites. It's just a cool looking Pokemon. Uh, did I say it right? It's Electric. It's the Wolf Electric one from Gen Three. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, I think Electric is Electabuzz's pre-evolution that they added later you're thinking shit, of shinx thinking of? Uh, luxray no oh, no shit. that's the cat one i'm talking about the one that's a wolf a wolf fuck i'm embarrassing myself from emerald <sighs> it's not a lectike me 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 ne not manectric nope wait not manectric manectrike maybe <laughs> I think that's right. Well, Manectrike the, is the pre-evolved pre form. He's like green with yellow stripes under his eyes. Yes. Okay. The evolved version of that. All right. The evolved version is Manectric. Don't tell anyone I had to look that up. <laughs> I had to look it up. Um, I am also a big fan of Swampert as well. Swampert's awesome. Gen 3 has the yeah, best muddy. starters. Yes, I agree. Muddy Water... It just, it just solves everything. It just, you don't, it, it, it pretty much does. The, it always wins most of the time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think my number one favorite Pokemon is Quagsire. So same type combo. Just, there you go. Just love that guy. Uh, do you have a favorite? If you had to start a file on a Pokemon game right now, which one would you go for? I would probably do a new one. Like just to like... You know, like I've the thing that the thing that kind of got me like lukewarm on Pokemon is after I beat Emerald and then I went to the next one, I was like, it's just it's just the same thing, man. It's yeah. like I'm just yeah, I'm just going to run around and collect them all and level up until I get to the Elite Four and then do the badges and then cool. Um, I know that they were trying to do like more of an open world thing, but honestly, like it really boggles my mind that we don't have an MMORPG that's fucking Pokemon. Like, I, yeah. I don't get it because 
if people were just able to have like legacy Pokemon that they own throughout their profile forever. I mean, yeah. look at the way that people play like NBA Jam 2K and stuff where they can have like local matches online against other people and form squads and stuff and do raids and shit. Like that would be kind of dope. Yeah, I don't know why they awesome. don't do it. Yeah. Get on it, if Nintendo. It was, yeah. I guess Nintendo and online have just never quite mixed well. They should co-develop that game with someone else. Yeah, agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that would that would get me back into Pokemon. But I would play. I would. I would want to play one of the newer ones just so I could see what kind of insane Pokemon exists now. Because I'd just really fallen off yeah. of keeping up with all the new Pokemon these days. I respect that answer. Um, one last question that I thought of to ask you specifically: Have you ever? So you you make art, you make music, you make games. Have you ever thought of like making up a, a world or some characters or something, and then making like different, like an album and a comic and a game that are all like based on the same world or the same characters or something like that? Yeah, I mean, like we do that with the terrible game stuff. Now um, we did an original soundtrack for Volca. Uh, the the creator of the game Brooke is a musician and I was chatting with him because he wrote the theme song for the pitch video for the Kickstarter okay and I was like dude that song turned out great like what do you think about doing an add-on item for uh, the Kickstarter where we sell people an audio cassette with an original soundtrack for each of the war bands and he was like I'll do it tomorrow and I was <laughs> like, okay cool <laughs> um, and then uh, for black mold I reached out to this really sick chiptune or not ch sorry not chiptune a dungeon synth artist named uh, Vandalorum and I, I actually went to the dungeon synth like Facebook group and was like hey I got this game I want to develop a solo roll and write game where the J card insert for the tape is the player interface where you place dice to play the game and inside the tape will be an actual soundtrack that you listen to while you play the solo That's game. That's awesome. And this this dude picked it up. I sent him a list of I sent him a track list with just song titles and explained what the game was. And dude made this absolutely amazing soundtrack for Black Mold. Um, and then in Token Terror's Battlegrounds season one, I did a forty page full color comic book that gives you a bunch of lore and story about each faction in the box. So like, yeah, the board game stuff is is great because. Um, that's exactly what they are. They're these little worlds that you just get to create and build and proliferate. And, you know, you can make them as, as rich and um, as generous content wise as you want. And we usually try to overreach, you know, somewhat so that we can, you know, be more, yeah. be more noticeable, be more remarkable. It's sort of what we're trying to do here. Okay, awesome. Well, I feel like this this episode of Down the Unicorn Hole is going to have about 15 times as many links as any previous <laughs> one, but I want all this stuff. I want links to all this stuff because everything you've described that I haven't already uh, checked out, I definitely want to dive into. Uh, uh, thanks, on that man. note, I'm going to give you the floor here if there's anything else you want to say or promote. No, you know, actually you gave me an opportunity to do plugs in the middle of each like thing. So like, we don't need to do it again. Now I've kind of already covered it. Well, come to Bitgen and hang out with two Johns with H's who love resident evil four. Uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be a fucking awesome time. Uh, it is going to be awesome. Oh, one thing I didn't mention for those who do like to party. I mentioned food trucks. I mentioned that it is all ages. It is also a rock and roll club with alcohol. And we usually have uh, like we have like four signature cocktails that are themed after like video games that we do at the show. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Drink responsibly. Get a hotel if you're going to get wild. Um, be respectful of everybody there. But it is uh, by all means like a huge ass party in addition to a really fun concert. Yeah, I can vouch for that, too. Uh yeah. <laughs> cool. I, well, I appreciate you spending the the giving you the floor at the end there to tell people to be responsible. That's good. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, you got you a little bit. You, gotta, you can't. You'd be like, hey, come out the bitch and get fucking wrecked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned it's all ages. That is that is a cool perk because uh, a lot of other similar fests are not. And I know that like last year, yeah, it was last year. I saw a kid there that had like a Sonic shirt or something, and I just said, "Hey, I like your shirt," and he's like, "Yeah, I like yours too." And he seemed like he was having a super good time. So it's cool to be able to see like young people there too, since it's so you know based on video games and stuff. And a lot of kids are obviously, I mean, everyone's into video games now. But yeah, I think that's a big absolutely. deal that it's all ages. That's super cool. And also, cos cosplay welcome. Come out, 
come out and do some cosplay if you want. I wouldn't wear anything that's like too like floofed out or has a lot of like protruding objects or anything because it is a tight little rock club. Yeah. But we've had like a we've had like a proto man cosplay or like a princess peach show up in previous years. So mm. you know, cosplay is always fun and welcome. Heck yeah. All right, man. Well, I'm going to let you get back to your uh, super busy schedule, but thank you so much for talking to me and for being awesome. Dude, thank you for being awesome. And thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. I'll see you in August, my guy. Hell yeah. I can't wait. And we hope we see you too, person watching. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right. I'll talk to you later, man. Peace. Yo, thanks for watching the whole honking thing. Let the guests know how rad they are and click their links and stuff. If you're new to the channel, I got a lot of Nintendo Core stuff, so check it. Or don't, I'm not your real dad. I have music of my own. You can find it everywhere. Yes, even there. I'm also on Patreon. I will never run ads. All my homies hate ads. So if you want to support this channel or my music or whatever, take a peek. Thanks again. Bye.